All right. Um, so, uh, what we're going to do um, today is talk basically about how you study microbes or a few examples of ways that you study microbes. And we're going to use as our model system for this the study of extremophiles, these organisms that live in the sort of tail end of the distribution pattern of other organisms. And in the next lecture, we're going to talk almost entirely about the microbes that live in and on people, also known as the human microbiome. Alas, before that, we are going to do our quiz. So you need to put everything away except your one page of notes. No phones, no other things out. And there are going to be five questions here. I'm going to give you a little over a minute for each one. So please, again, put everything away. All right, so I'm not going to read these out loud, so I'm just going to start. Uh, you have a minute and 15 seconds for each one. Twenty seconds left. <coughs> All right, so we're just going to move on to question number two here. I will move this out of the way. Twenty seconds left. All right. Question three. 
20 seconds. All right, question four. Twenty seconds. <coughs> right, and then the last question. Twenty seconds. <laughs> All right. Give you a minute or so to recover and chat with your neighbors about. Uh, Answers and then we'll get on with lecture in a minute. Thanks, Professor. You're welcome. I wrote uh, just in case anyone knows how it's a little reminder. Get going in a second here. So um, we're going to be scheduling at least one 
midterm review session, we will send an email announcement about this. I will also have office hours uh, on Friday. I'm going to at least have them from 12.30 to 1.30, if not uh, longer, um, in between classes. But I might add some extra office hours for people to come and ask questions. And don't forget, you can go to office hours to ask pretty much any time to ask someone uh, questions. There's usually a TA or faculty or someone there. So what we're going to do today is talk about methods for studying microbes and use, as I said, extremophiles as our sort of template. We're going to talk about three sort of categories of approaches to studying microbes, to observe them in the field, to culture them, that's growing them in the laboratory, or as you will see why in a little bit, something I generally refer to as CSI microbiology, which is basically sort of forensic type approaches to looking at uh, microbes. So just to sort of uh, cover the, remind you about the diversity of microorganisms, there's incredible diversity out there and we can observe the diversity in a lot of different ways. We can look at them in the microscope. We can go to environments where microbes are found and see the structures they take, make hypotheses about the functions that are being carried out there. Um, and again, there's incredible diversity out there in terms of environments where microbes are found and in processes that we think microbes play important roles. We're going to focus on extremophiles again as the example. And what, what is meant by extremophile or extremophily is if you looked at the range of organisms, if you compare some environmental variable like temperature or pH or salt levels, um, pressure, any other type of environmental variable, if you look at the extreme limits of that variable where life occurs, so the highest and lowest temperatures, the highest and lowest pHs, etc. There's some line that some, someone or some ones have drawn near the end of that range where one, the, the extreme set, the things at the tail end of that range are called extremophiles. And we'll, we'll see how that's defined for a couple of types of extremophily uh, throughout the class. But there certainly are lots of environments out there where there are organisms living where you might not have expected it if you based everything on how you know, the common forms of life get stressed out by some of these environments, like growing at very high temperatures. When people are interested in well, really in any organism in the environment, but in particular in microbes, because that's what we're focusing on here. There are a lot of questions that you can ask about them, but you can divide these questions into two primary categories, really. Questions about who are they? That is, what are the kinds of microbes found in a particular place? And questions about what are they doing? That is, what are the functions whether that be biochemical or physiological or behavioral or whatever, what are the functions of the microbes that are there? And really, who is doing what? So connecting the who is out there to the functional processes. And again, we're going to focus on extremophiles, but the principle applies to any type of organism across any, any type of microorganism across any environment. So the first thing, sort of obvious, uh, that you can do is you can go to wherever the microbes that you're interested in are found and observe them or observe their processes or things that you think are their processes like photosynthesis or um, carbon cycling or sulfur metabolism, etc. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this because you're probably most familiar with field observations of organisms as a tool in studying biology. It was discussed extensively in uh, BIS2B, and it's just sort of common sense to a lot of people that you can go out and measure things in the field. So, you know, with plants and animals, 
you can go out. This is uh, Vladimir Nabokov, the writer who also happened to be an obsessed lepidopterist. Um, uh, you can go out and collect them, right, and study them when you collect them in the field. You can go to some field site, pick a particular site, and study sort of everything at that site. There's a lot of work using satellite imagery, so you don't even have to be physically, you know, seeing the organisms themselves, but you can monitor either some effect of the organisms or maybe wavelengths that they reflect at. You can be more systematic about it. So this is a quadrat where you lay down a grid and you study the organisms in the different parts of the grid. You can use tools. This kid has no clue, but um, you can use uh, tools to help you in this process. It's common to use you know, binoculars and telescopes for many animals that are out there. And you can go to all sorts of diverse environments, even ones you know, where people didn't used to spend a lot of time and do your observations. And this is just the common way that plants and animals on the planet are studied. We can do basically these same things for microbes or for the organisms that I'm, you know, the rest of the organisms on the planet other than fungi, plants, and animals. You can go out and collect them in the field. So this is someone collecting from a Yellowstone hot spring, microbes living inside of it. You can sort of pick your particular environment like the oceans and go out and sample the oceans. You can use satellite imagery to look at microbes in the oceans. As I've mentioned before, there are certain wavelengths of chlorophyll that you can monitor um, with satellite imagery. You can do a more systematic quadrat-based approach. We don't use binoculars, of course, to look at them, but we do use microscopes all the time to monitor microbes. And you can go to all sorts of bizarre environments and study the microbes that are there. So field observation, really in concept, works the same way that it does for birds or butterflies or trees or uh, any other types of large macroorganisms. However, in, in practice, there's a big problem with this. And the problem is that, as we have discussed, the appearance of a microbe, in particular bacteria and archaea, but also some of the other eukaryotes, some of the eukaryotes, the appearance is not a great indicator of what kind of microbe you are looking at. There are microbes that look like this, a single coccus, scattered throughout the bacterial tree. There are microbes that look like a bacillus, a rod, scattered throughout the bacterial tree. There are corkscrew-shaped organisms scattered throughout the tree. Just these appearances don't tell us what kind of microbe we are looking at. Um, so because appearance is misleading, that can be a challenge. Now, if you work on plants and animals, appearance is much more useful, though not perfect. But many people here probably have used or are familiar with field guides. If you're interested in birds or butterflies or plants, you can have a book that built, a, built by you know, lots of years of research and collection of information, but at some point you can get together a book where if you see an organism, you can look up what it looks like and figure out what kind it is, what its range should be, what its behaviors and possible other biological features can be, and even information about how to distinguish it from close relatives. If you're interested in this type of thing, by the way, there's a cool new uh, phone app that was designed by a grad student here on the butterflies of Northern California. So, you know, now with your phones, you can go around and uh, try and identify lots of organisms without your, you know, your field guide book, but with an app or something to that effect. Now, we don't have that type of thing for microbes, largely because of this appearance issue, but also because the, the diversity has not yet been completely characterized. Um, so, you know, for some microbial eukaryotes, appearance is a little bit more useful than for bacteria and archaea, but that's not for all of them. So we talked about, like, the diatoms, which have these incredibly complex and interesting uh, morphological features, and you can actually type many diatoms very precisely based upon their appearance. But for many microbial eukaryotes, that's not the case. There's another reason why this field work can be challenging. So if you're interested in the biology of birds or the biology of trees, um, when you go out to the field and you do an observation, you can collect a sample, say, you know, a couple of leaves from the tree or 
you can collect the bird, as many birders do, and bring it back to the lab and grind it up or do something to it. Um, and you have a lot of material with which you can do studies of the biology of those organisms. When you go out to the field for microbes, frequently what you're doing is looking in a microscope, and even if you could identify things by their appearance, you might just have one cell of the kind of microbe that you're interested in. You're not going to do a lot of experiments on that single cell to figure out sort of what the biology, the, what that cell is doing. And so field observations, they're very useful. They're used throughout microbiology, but they do have some limitations as to exactly what you can do. And what many scientists do if they're interested in the microbes in a particular environment, they go to that environment, they bring back samples, and they try and take those samples and grow the microbes that are in those samples in the laboratory under controlled conditions where you can make larger volumes of particular microbes and do more detailed studies of them. And this is generally called culturing, the growth of microorganisms in these defined conditions in the laboratory. You can go to an environment and, you know, put out a, a set of food for the microbes and grow them and if you just sort of take your environmental sample and put it right into the food, you might get what's called a mixed culture. You know, 10, 100, 1,000 different kinds of microbes all growing together in your sample. That's less than ideal for many studies. And what people really try to do is obtain what's called a pure culture, where you, usually through a series of dilution steps, you isolate each individual cell from other individual cells from your sample. And then you grow up copies of that individual cell in isolation from everything else, and that's what's called a pure culture. And it allows you to study that individual cell, that individual species in much more detail when it's isolated from everything else. So to do this, you can give them food and you can test what are the energy requirements for the organism. So is it a phototroph or a chemotroph? What are the electron sources? What are the carbon sources? You can test all the different forms of trophy that you might want to do. You can look at all the other conditions required for the organism, what it prefers to do, what are its physiological and biochemical processes, and so on. And that really is sort of best done in isolation in these uh, pure culture conditions. Now, the reason this works <coughs> Well, so just, you know, this is an example. This is like growing things in a test tube. You can grow them on these plates where you put a jello-like a substance called agar that you're growing things on. And the reason this works is because what happens when you isolate a single cell and then let it grow is that they reproduce asexually. This is what you really want to have happen. So for bacteria and archaea, they undergo the process of binary fission, which we've talked about before. The cell makes a copy of its genome and then splits down the middle. So you have two what are called daughter cells that should be identical in their genome to the parental cell unless there's been some, chain, some mutation where the copying, there was a mistake. And most of the time, there are very few, if any, mistakes made during this copying for most organisms when you're growing them in pure culture in the laboratory. So you take a single cell, you've isolated it from everything else, you give it the right nutrients, it makes copies of itself, they make copies of themselves, they make copies of themselves, and eventually, over a relatively short period of time usually, you can get billions to trillions of copies of that original cell. And now when you do an experiment on this giant pool of cells, they're all genetically identical to each other. So you're basically studying this cell, just lots of copies of it or clones of it when you're doing these experiments in the laboratory. So this pure culturing is really important because it allows you to just make these billions and trillions of copies. And for bacteria and archaea, this is, you know, you take advantage of this binary fission. For eukaryotes, what you really want to have happen in most of these cases is also asexual reproduction. Eukaryotes do this by mitosis. So the cell will make a copy of itself. The parental cell will make a, two daughter cells. The mechanism is different. Exactly how the genome gets copied and allocated to the daughter cells is this more orchestrated, complicated process of mitosis. But the principle is the same. 
you isolate a single eukaryotic cell, it makes copies of itself, that make, they make copies of themselves, and you end up with billions of cells. So this culturing sort of works in the same way for bacteria and archaea and microbial eukaryotes. And in the end, you're now able to do lots of experiments with one particular microorganism, just like you might be able to do if you took you know, a bird back to the laboratory or leaves from a tree back to the laboratory. You now have that microbe and, and its you know, clones. So this allows you to throw all sort of the tools of biology at that particular microbe to do genetics and physiology and genomics and biochemistry and so on. And I'm not going to go into all the details of this. We'll talk about this in a little detail. Um, one of the things that you can do, and usually the first thing that many people do, is they try and figure out what they were growing. So you got something to grow up, you want to type it. You want to know what it is. And you can look at it in the microscope, but again, remember, appearance is not the best indicator of what you are growing. So what people basically do these days is they read some of the DNA sequence of the organism, like Carl Woese did with ribosomal RNA genes. In fact, ribosome RNA genes are frequently the target even now. And you answer the question, who was out there in your environment by growing things from the environment and then typing the different things you grow. So you go, you get that something growing in the lab, you extract the DNA, you run some reaction, like I've mentioned, the polymerase chain reaction to make copies of a gene of interest, like the ribosomal RNA. You sequence, you read the string of letters in those ribosomal RNA genes from your sample. If you had a pure culture, you'll get out just one ribosomal RNA sequence, hopefully. You make a data matrix to compare your ribosomal RNA sequence to those that have been characterized in known organisms, and you build an evolutionary tree. And you look at where your organism sits on an evolutionary tree compared to other organisms. And this is the equivalent of what you would do with a field guide to birds by saying that is uh, an American kestrel or that is a red-winged blackbird. And now you're able to say that this is either you can say what species it is or at least what clade that it is a member of. So again, you use basically the same approach that Carl Woese did. You use the data that other people have collected from microbes and you place your new organism onto a tree to tell you what it is, what type of microbe you got from the environment. So of course, you know, just saying what type of microbe something is is not necessarily all you want to do. You also want to know what they're doing. And what you do is, by inference, you don't know exactly what they're doing in the environment, but you grow them in the laboratory and you test what they can do in the laboratory and that can tell you a lot about what they might have been doing or be able to do in the environment. So I'm going to give you two examples of this relating to extremophiles. So one example relates to these halophiles, organisms that grow in high salt concentrations. The general first step that many people do when they go to a particular environment and want to understand some of the biology of that organism might be to just test a bunch of different environmental conditions to see what the optimal conditions are for your organism of interest. So let's say you went to this salty environment. You've tried to grow things from that environment. You've even grown in pure culture some of them. The food that you gave them to grow in pure culture might not be their favorite thing. It's just what you were able to use to get them to grow. Now you do an experiment to test what is the best food to give them or the best environmental conditions? So I have it in text here, but I'm going to show you in pictures what this sort of general protocol is. But if you want to go back to it, you can look at this uh, slide. So the general protocol is as follows. You go to your environment. You physically isolate cells in some way. You do a dilution. And eventually you grow some of them in pure culture. You generally would grow up a batch of this organism in a test tube, so you have a, what's called a starter culture of it. And then you can take that starter culture and pull out equal amounts of that starter culture into different tubes. And that allows you to compare things going on in those different tubes with the same total starting amount of material of that organism. So you might take out a billion cells into each tube, for example. That's not a lot, by the way, for microbes. Um, so that's a tiny, small volume in most cases. 
So if you wanted to test what salt conditions this microbe really liked to grow at, you would do the following kind of experiment. You would set up a bunch of flasks with the general like sugar or other food that the organism likes to eat and the, you need to give it, again, its energy source, its carbon source, and its electron um, sources. You add a small portion of this starter culture, equal amounts to each of these tubes. And now, you know, it's a little bit, a tiny bit of the organism in each of these tubes. And then you either do this beforehand or you do it afterwards. You give each tube a different condition. So one molar salt in this tube, two molar salt in that one, three molar in this one, and four molar. So you're now comparing different salt concentrations across the different tubes. And you now give it time to grow. If the organism likes one of these salt conditions, it should grow faster in that one than in the other ones. So you monitor the growth over time. You can usually do this just by the, the color, if it's a colored organism, or by the absorbance. If it's not a colored organism, you can beam a light through it and just see, in essence, how little of the light gets through in the tube. So you monitor after one hour, two hours, three hours, etc. And you take that and you plot it. Time versus total amount of material, the absorbance, which is usually equivalent to the number of cells. So now you see that in three molar salt, the growth was the highest. You convert this information into a growth rate, so a rate of growth per unit time, and now you plot it again versus salt, and you can see that the highest growth rate was in three molar salt concentration. So people have done this for hundreds to thousands of different kinds of organisms, and this is how we determine in a large, in largely what to call an extremophile. We don't necessarily determine it by where they're found in the environment, because an organism might be growing in a high salt, but it might be doing that just because it, it's been outcompeted everywhere else. It may not prefer to grow in high salt conditions. So what the sort of formal way to describe whether or not something is an extremophile is to test in the laboratory what it actually prefers to do, what is its favorite place to grow, and you do this by these growth rate, one of the ways you do this is by these growth rate curves. So here's sodium ion concentration, which is a form of salt, versus growth rate, and you see that different organisms, these are individual species, have different peaks for their growth rate at different salt concentrations. Over here, you have E. coli, the standard laboratory bacterial taxon. It does not like salt when you put it in its growth media, and it basically stops growing as soon as the sodium concentration gets to be moderately high. So that's called a non-halophile. It doesn't like salt. There are organisms that are what are called halotolerant. So Staphylococcus aureus, it likes to grow at low salt concentrations but it can tolerate growing at higher and higher salt concentrations. It doesn't completely kill it like those do to E. coli. And then you have organisms that are starting to be at the end of the salt concentrations where other organisms grow, like this Vibrio fisheri, which is a proteobacterium. And it likes to grow at higher salt concentrations, and so it's what's called a halophile. There's a special category of halophiles that like to grow at really, really high salt concentrations, like where the salt is basically precipitating out of the solution. And these are called extreme halophiles. So this is how you define, really, what is an extremophile for different types of growth conditions. Yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah, when they, when, so these halotolerant organisms, what you're plotting here is growth rate. So actually Staphylococcus aureus might just sit there and not die. We're not plotting in this case, um, you know, long-term death rates. You can do that too. And so you can determine that organisms, even when they're not growing, some of them will die. Some of them will just sit there. 
So in this case, we're just looking at growth rate. Staphylococcus aureus is nasty because it can just sit there in environments that it doesn't particularly like and wait them out until it gets better environments. Other organisms like E. coli, basically, you put them in high salt, they're dead. They will never recover. So it depends. And in this experiment, we're just looking at growth rate. So when people have done this, they've now looked for halophiles across the planet, as well as extreme halophiles. And then you can do experiments on them and try and figure out what they're able to do to grow and thrive and even prefer to grow in these high salt concentrations. So the first thing to think about here is what happens to a normal cell that does not like salt? What happens to it when you put it in a salty environment? And what happens is basically if you put, here's a, just a cartoon of a cell, and you put it in an environment, these are supposed to represent salt ions, some you know, sodium, potassium, whatever. The water inside the cell will try to leave the cell to balance the osmotic gradient of having these high ion concentrations outside the cell. And the cell will basically desiccate. It will lose its water. Many cells do not like that and die. Um, what people have found by culturing and then studying halophiles is that they all basically do the same thing in concept, although they do it in different ways. What they do is they fill up the inside of their cells with solutes to balance this osmotic pressure of the water. The water basically wants to travel out of the membrane um, to, to where there's a higher concentration of dissolved particles, solutes. And if you fill up the inside of the cell with anything that's dissolved, it will balance this pressure of the water to leave. What varies, though, is what organisms fill up the inside of the cell with. Some of them fill it up with proteins. Some of them fill it up with carbohydrates. A very few of them fill it up with salts. They also do other things, like they try and pump some of the ions in and out of the cell. And many of them are also very resistant to desiccation, because even if they can resist some of this pressure when they live in really high salt environments, they end up getting desiccated anyway. Um, so people have learned how organisms are able to survive these conditions by doing the culturing experiments in the lab. And what is particularly interesting in this case is that there are halophiles sort of scattered throughout the tree of life. Many of them use these, fill up the cell with proteins. Many of them fill up with carbohydrates. But very, very few of them fill up the inside of the cell with salts. In particular, there's one clade of archaea known as the extreme halophiles. Unfortunately, their formal name is the halobacteria, even though they're archaea, but we're going to ignore that for a minute. Um, many people refer to them as haloarchaea now, but it goes back and forth. But this is interesting. There's just one monophyletic group that has figured out this way to fill up the inside of the cell with salts to compensate for growing in these high salt environments. And this is of interest to biotechnology companies. There are many industrial reactions that people like to do that require or that are in high salt solutions. If you want an enzyme from an organism where the enzyme itself can survive and work in high salt concentrations, you need an organism that fills up the inside of its cell with salt. This is them. These are the only organisms that really do that, and they are the source of many enzymes for various processes whenever you have to do that process, like laundry detergent, for example, ends up having a lot of salt in it. Um, and they get a lot of the enzymes for it from halophiles like this. Um, so we're just going to switch and talk about another example of this, doing the same thing with organisms that grow at high temperatures. This is an overhead view of one of the hot springs in Yellowstone National Park. The different colors generally correspond to different taxa that live at the different temperatures. It's hotter in the middle. It's cooler as you head up onto the land here. So you can do the same thing. You can go to that environment and instead of comparing different salt concentrations, you can compare different growth temperatures. So you isolate organisms from the environment. You grow them in pure culture in the laboratory. You make your starter culture. You set up the flasks, and now you're going to put the flasks in different temperature environments. 
add a little starter culture to them and compare how the organism grows at different temperatures. People have also done this for hundreds to thousands of different taxa. You monitor the growth rate over time. You plot the growth versus time. You calculate a growth rate. And now you can do this for many different organisms. And people have come up with a diversity of names to describe the different growth temperatures that organisms prefer. So it turns out there are some organisms out there that in fact prefer to grow at about four degrees Celsius. Very, very cold temperatures. If you warm them up, they start to die. These are organisms that are isolated from places like um, the Antarctic oceans or a variety of other very cold environments. They're called psychrophiles when they grow at low temperatures. Mesophiles are basically the normal temperature organisms or the organisms that grow around the temperature that we like. Uh, so E. coli, which lives in our gut, happens to like the temperature that we are at, you know, 97 degrees or, uh, you know, 37 or so um, Celsius. Once you cross over about 50 degrees Celsius for the optimal growth temperature, these are what are called thermophiles. So this is a plot for Bacillus, this particular low GC gram positive species that grows optimally at 60 degrees Celsius. And when you cross over about 85 degrees Celsius, the organisms are called hyperthermophiles. This is you know, very, very hot, right? This is nearly the boiling point of water. And in fact, amazingly, there are organisms that prefer to grow above the temperature of the boiling point of water. Now, if you put those organisms into actual boiling water, they would be killed. <coughs> boiling water, in part because of the, the air bubbles and other things, the movement of all the particles tends to kill lots of organisms. But these organisms can survive and thrive at higher temperatures because the environment that they live in is in the bottom of the ocean. And in the bottom of the ocean, the pressure from the water above makes the boiling temperature of water down in the bottom of the ocean higher. And so these organisms can basically thrive at above the boiling point of water on the surface because the water down in the bottom of the ocean is boiling at higher temperatures. There's even an organism that can grow at 115 degrees Celsius. So if you plot this for different organisms, you don't have to know the details on this slide. I'm going to show you the big picture in a second. You compare different organisms to each other and what temperatures they like to grow at. You see an interesting trend, which is that the extreme thermophiles, the very high temperature organisms, are dominated by the archaea. There are very, very few other organisms that can grow at those temperatures. In fact, there are only a couple of bacterial species that can do it. So extremely high temperatures, archaea dominate those ecosystems, like the boiling hot vents in the bottom of the ocean. There are many bacteria that can grow at high temperatures and very few eukaryotes. So for thermophily, for high temperature growth, there seems to be a bias where archaea can do it best, bacteria are sort of next best, and eukaryotes are not particularly good at it. An interesting thing, if you compare where the thermophiles are across the tree of life, this again is the expanded tree that I showed you before of the many lineages of bacteria, including those that we didn't talk about the many lineages of archaea, including those that we did not talk about. In red are different thermophile groups. There are probably hundreds of different origins of the ability to grow at high temperatures scattered throughout the bacteria in archaea. Unlike the extreme halophiles, which seems to have been invented basically once, there are many different cases where an organism goes from growing at low temperature to eventually evolving the ability to grow at higher temperatures. Again, you can study the mechanisms of this in the laboratory by growing organisms in pure culture. If you ask what are the stresses you would imagine occur with high temperature, high temperature should, for a mesophile, a normal organism, denature the proteins so that they will no longer work, denature the RNA, denature the DNA, that is it unwinds, proteins 
work by their folded three-dimensional structures, heat will unwind them and open them up. What thermophiles do, although they've invented this separately many different times in different lineages, is they've invented ways to make their proteins more stable. So one of them is, you may or may not remember this, but in proteins you can have um, covalent bonds across different amino acids between cysteine residues. That can lock a protein into its shape. So many thermophiles use more of these covalent bonds to hold their proteins in shape. They also use different amino acids that tend to be the, you could say, stickier amino acids to hold their proteins together. There are lots of other things that thermophiles do, like high temperatures should make the membranes of a cell really liquefied. Thermophiles basically gunk up their membranes with stuff to keep it from blowing apart. The, the gunk, that's a technical term, that they use differs in different taxa. going to skip over that. Um, so people have done all sorts of experiments with all sorts of different extremophilic conditions. You don't have to know the details on this slide. It's just in case you are interested. Lots of different interesting extremophiles with all sorts of wild adaptations for those extreme conditions. There are many people who would like to isolate enzymes from these organisms in order to use them in various scientific research and industrial processes. One of the top companies in the world to do this is in Davis. Novozymes, they specialize in isolating enzymes from diverse microorganisms. So if you're interested in this type of thing, they actually have internships and other programs, and they do some really interesting biotechnology with extremophiles. The last thing I want to introduce, which will also be the topic of much of the next lecture, is this CSI microbiology thing. So the reason we need special sort of forensic methods to study microbes relates to this problem I'm going to describe called the great plate count anomaly. If you go to an environment like a Yellowstone hot spring and you take a sample and you split it in two, and in half of the sample you look in the microscope and you count how many cells you see in the microscope, and in the other half of the sample you count how many things you're able to grow in pure culture in the laboratory, in every environment that we go to, there are many, many orders of magnitude more things that we can see in the microscope than we've been able to grow in the laboratory. This means that we are missing the vast majority of microbial diversity by focusing on culturing as our means to study them. And what people have figured out a way around this, there are a few, but one way around it is to go to the environment and isolate DNA directly from your environmental sample without ever growing anything in the laboratory. This is where the sort of forensic methodology comes in. And it turns out you can take that DNA and read the ribosomal RNA genes in that DNA just like you would do from a cultured organism. You can build an evolutionary tree and now you've never grown the organism in the laboratory, but you can tell evolutionarily what it is related to and study the types of organisms in an environmental sample without ever rearing them in the laboratory. And so this works I have a couple of slides, but I'm going to sort of skip over them. This works if there's one organism in the environmental sample that you've never been able to grow in the lab. So there are many things that live inside plants and animals as what are called endosymbionts that are not organelles. There are many other bacteria that live inside various organisms like these tube worms. You can, can't grow them in the laboratory, but you can read their DNA sequences and figure out what they are. And the great thing about this methodology and what we will talk about a lot in the next lecture is even if there are hundreds of organisms in the environment, in one reaction you can figure out what all of them are by typing all of the different ribosomal RNA genes in one environmental sample. And then you can study, for example, the thousands of species of microbes that are on our skin without having to grow them all in the lab.